All right, today we're going to be reviewing the SP Racing H7 Extreme. And I have to agree with the name, this thing is extremely feature packed. So the first thing, of course, is the H7 processor. So what does that mean? We're used to hearing about the F1 processor, the F3 processor, F4, F7, now we're in the H7. The H7 is the fastest processor in the STM32 category. Just a quick rundown of processor speeds. The F3 processor is around 72 megahertz. F4 processor can get up to around 180 megahertz max. That's not what Betaflight runs, but if you'd overclock it, you could get up that high. The F7 processor can get up to 216 megahertz, and the H7 can get up to 400 megahertz. So it's kind of funny, you know, when I started using computers back in the early 90s, my first IBM PS1 computer was, I believe, 100 megahertz. And then I upgraded, and I was in the big time when I went to 500 megahertz. So this is the same processor speed on those first computers, you know, IBM PS1, stuff like that in the early 90s era. But the big difference to underline this is the difference between the F4 and the F7, you know, it's 180 megahertz max to 216. Yeah, that's faster, but the F7 to the H7 is double. You know, that's 216 up to 480. I believe this runs at 400 megahertz on it. So it's, you know, it's double the processing power on this chip. Now, do we need that for everything nowadays? Maybe not, but it's definitely future-proofed that um, you're not going to have any cycle time loop problems with any firmware you run on this thing. Other things unique to this board is it has dual gyros. One is parallel to the board layout, another is a 45 degree angle, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later. Of course, it has Betaflight on-screen display. It has PID audio, which essentially you can hook up the audio signal to your VTX audio and then transmit that back to an earbud. And you can hear essentially the oscillation of your PID sum, which is driving your motors, and then you can use that as a tuning thing. I'll do a future video on that where we'll test that out and see what that sounds like and what a good tune sounds like versus a bad tune. It has 128 megabytes of onboard data flash for black box storage. In addition, it has an SD card slot, which you can go up to a 32 gig SD card. So I don't know of any other board that has both. So that is pretty unique. Uh, you can go either flavor. The 128 megabytes alone is a pretty big deal. And then, of course, throwing on this SD card slot is, is really nice as well. It can support from 2S up to 6S input power. It has a barometer on it, a BMP388 barometer. It has six UARTs, which we'll look at that in a little bit. It has the capability to hook up an IR sensor for a lap transponder. It has 12 motor outputs available on it, and it has the pads available on it, not only for separate ESCs on the arm, but also a pad back here to connect your 4-in-1 ESC. It has a shunt resistor here to measure your current and the amp draw, and then it can either output through the separate pads here. These are your power pads, the positive and ground, and then you have your signal and ground wires connecting to here. And each one of those you can see, here's the power, and then your signal and ground. It also has the option for this sister board. Now this sister board is a VTX board that you can put a TBS or other VTX on it here, solder it to it, and then this sister board you can see will connect right up with these prongs right here, and we can get that to marry together here. And then it just gives you an ultra low profile to put your VTX right on your stack. And you can see like that. And then you, your smart audio connects through it. There's basically no wiring then. Your TBS board would fit onto here or other VTX. Uh, you'd have the lead coming off for the antenna. There'd be no wiring then from your VTX to your board. And you can see that gap there of how tight that can be. And then right below that, you would have your then either your 4-in-1 ESC or you'd have the ESCs on the individual arms. I think this board retails for about uh, $13, so not too bad for that, and it's a nice little adder. If you do have this board for the SP Racing F7, this same board for the F7 uh, fits the F7 or the H7.
Now it looks like on here this is a pin header for a UART5 connector. Over here is an SWD connector for debug socket. And then on the bottom here is an IO socket that is a made up of UART8, UART3, so it's UART8 transmit and receive, UART3 transmit and receive, and then the I2C1 connector and a plus and a minus, or a power and a ground. That's a little bit of an odd choice. I would think this would have been better suited to have a Form 1 pin header to go down to the ESCs, but maybe that can be resource remapped to serve that purpose. We can look that up and see what we can throw about that in the comment. Or maybe Dominic can comment on that. I think it's important to acknowledge that the board designer for this flight controller is Dominic Clifton. He's the creator of Clean Flight and is active in the Betaflight project. As you can see, as it stands today, he still has the most commits to Betaflight. That's mostly because of all his work he did on Clean Flight, you can see back then. But it's still active today in 2019 and 2020. He's a real innovative person. I know he's working on coding up new gyro chips into Betaflight as well. He's working with the Flight 1 guys. You can see from this board design how he's always looking to push the hobby further, innovate, and bring new things to the market. Looking at the SP Racing H7 lineup at the time of recording of this video, you can see we have the H7 Extreme, the H7 Zero, and the H7 Nano. The H7 Nano is a 20 by 20 board configuration with, of course, the H7 chip on it. Of course, this has to drop some features, but you still have your 128 megabyte of flash, your ICM 2602 gyros, which most boards carry nowadays. In this configuration, it's a single gyro, not dual gyro. Still, 2 to 6S LiPo power, 8 motor output, 6 zero UARTs. This is the top configuration of the Nano. You can see all the chips and the USB port are on top. Then it comes in two different flavors. One, it has pin connectors here for your motors and your 4-in-1 ESC. Also then, of course, your pads here, and you can see some of the silk screen on that. And you can also then just go to this website and check out the manual for the different items. You can see we still here have a pin header to connect to a sister board. This is for connecting your RX, some peripherals, some peripherals over here, and then your 4-in-1 ESC pin connector. That is the H7 Nano E series. If you do not want pin headers and you just want to be able to solder everything, you can see you have that option here as well. It's just taking off the pin headers and then you would just solder your wires directly to here for your 4-in-1 ESC. Same thing for your TX, RX, and some peripherals on both sides. And of course, all the stuff in the middle here. The other flavor is the H7 Zero. So the main difference between the H7 Zero and the H7 Extreme is the H7 Extreme is a PCB as well. So you wire your battery directly to it. It gets your current. All the current flows through it out to the ESCs. You can get your current sensing, your milliamps drawn, things of that nature. This board is not a PDB. Similarly to the Nano, all the chipsets are up top on this. It has a single gyro, the 2602. It has the 128 flash, OSD, things of that nature. You can check out the website for all the features. In wiring it up, it everything is soldered to the bottom. There's no pin headers available, but you, you can see all the silk screening here and where you connect all your motor wires to your ESCs, VTX, camera. Taking a look at the SB Racing H7 Extreme in Betaflight, you can see the eight UARTs that are available. Down here, how we have the first, second, or both gyro configuration. So first is just using gyro one, second is just using gyro two, or both puts it into sensor fusion mode. This actually has to deal with the orientation of the chips. I do not recommend messing with that unless you're an advanced user. We have our IR race transponder configuration here. Works with ILAP, Arc iTime, or, e or ERLT. And then going to the black box, you can see the option for the onboard flash or the SD card for either using the 124 megs of flash for storage of black box or just popping in an SD card and using that. So I did run some tests where I loaded up two flight controllers onto the same rig. This is the SP Racing F7, and then I also put on top of that the SP Racing H7, powered both, and then black box logged on both. So they saw the same flight noise, same flight data. These are steel um, studs, not nylon standoffs. And I was doing that to compare the difference between, this has a dual gyro as well, and you can see that they're parallel in that so this one is that one or both now they're changed 90 degrees from each other 
So the fingers that measure roll are different than the fingers that measure roll on this one in between the two different gyros. They're both ICM 2602 gyro chips. Same thing for here. It's just what you can see here again, one is at 45 degree angle versus the other one is parallel to the side of the board. So does that make a difference? Does that help with gyro noise detection or kind of canceling out within the sensor fusion realm? Looking at the gyro readings compared to the SP Racing F7, which also has dual gyros. Now this graph is showing us a waterfall plot of the motion and the vibrations the gyro is reading. We're really only interested in this motion down here the darker the red to white, that's that's higher amplitude stuff. So down here you have this high amplitude, but it's really low frequency. So that's your moving of the quad. That's the motion we're interested in. Anything say above 100 hertz, we are not interested in getting. And that's what the filters are trying to chop out. So as it's the gyro is reading this stuff up here, it's actually stuff we wanna get out of the signal. Again, the filters are working to chop that stuff out, but that filtering adds latency to the signal itself so it's a uh, it's better to just not read it in the first place on this graph you can see throttle percentage on the bottom and then this is the frequency of the noise so as the vibrations are closer together they're of a higher frequency and as it's more closer to white that's a higher amplitude so we can see a lot just for one of these plots so this gives us a good read on where the vibrations are in throttle per you know based on throttle percent the frequency and the amplitude and this band here you see go across here this is the motor vibrations the motor peak band as i increase throttle that motor vibration goes up in frequency because the motors are spinning faster higher rpms translates to the oscillations from the motor and props and air moving over the props be closer tighter and higher frequency these two gyros are the SP Racing F7, so this is gyro 1, gyro 2 on that board. This is gyro 1 and gyro 2 on the H7. This is roll access. This is pitch access down here, and you can see the gyro readings between these two. Essentially the same, but slight variance in the amount of noise they're picking up, and then the same thing between the gyros on the H7. Essentially the same, slightly different variance in some of the mean and peak results here. Same thing down here. All in all, between the two boards, the gyros are picking up about the same noise. You can see there's a, a differential here from the lower board to the higher board. That could just be a sensitivity difference. Noise getting into this gyro, the pitch access a little bit more heavier on the higher board in the stack than the lower board. But when they're within, you know, point uh, one or two of the peak, there's really uh, not much difference. So. It's not like we're trying to have these numbers exactly the same or expect them to exactly match. When running a log, just using gyro one on both boards, you can see the difference here. So that it looks like the higher board in this run was picking up a little less noise on gyro one. It looked like on the H7, gyro one was really well suited for not picking up a lot of noise or vibration from the quadcopter. You can see a little bit of difference here. So you have this a little bit more red here, a little less here, and this is after it's filtered. Now this one has the RPM filter. This one has just the dynamic notch, no RPM filtering on it. Now in this run here, this is the SP Racing F7 just using gyro one, and this is the SP Racing H7 using gyro two or sensor fusion mode. And you can see there's a little less noise when it's in sensor fusion mode, but if you saw previously, there was a little less noise because of that gyro one on the H7 as well. So just like when I looked at the iFlight board, you know, when we were back looking at 32K sampling as an option, this sensor fusion had a lot more gains. Now in 8K is the only option for running in beta flight. Sensor fusion has some marginal benefits, but it's not really the smoking gun. Typically, one of the gyros on the board reads a little less noise than the other one, so it's almost better to just log both and see which one is reading the least amount of motor noise and just run with that one. And then if that gyro gets funky or whatever after a crash, you can just switch over to the other one, almost like a replacement. So the goal with a good gyro trip is to just not read that higher frequency vibration altogether. We want to get good data down here, but we want to just not have that high frequency vibration be read up here as much as possible. All gyros read it. Uh, the filtering is there to cut it out, but the filtering has the downside of the more filtering you need, the more latency on the gyro signal, and it's more latency across the entire reading. So even this data down here is offset in time, which then 
is problematic for flight performance because if the PID loop's reacting to old data, of course the quad's doing something else by the time this, the reaction goes back out to the motor, so that's a delayed response that's not good. Okay, so that is it for the SP Racing H7 Extreme Dual Flight Controller. You can see it's currently out of stock on GetFPV, but if you go to shop.seriouslypro.com, it's available for purchase direct from Dominic in the different flavors, the H7 Extreme, the Nano, and the Zero. Thanks everybody, and I hope this helped.